Joe Jim Gregory was playing himself a game of checkers. Time was when they had played cards together, but Joe, the head on the right, had suspected Jim, the left-hand member of the team, of cheating. They had quarreled about it, then given it up, for they both learned early in their joint career that two heads on one pair of shoulders must necessarily find ways of getting along together. Checkers was better. They could both see the board, and disagreement was impossible. A loud metallic knocking at the door of the compartment interrupted the game. Joe Jim unsheathed his throwing knife and cradled it, ready for quick use. Come in, roared Jim. The door opened. The one who had knocked backed into the room, the only safe way, as everyone knew, to enter Joe Jim's presence. The newcomer was squat and ruggedly powerful, not over four feet in height. The relaxed body of a man hung across one shoulder and was steadied by a hand. Joe Jim returned the knife to its sheath. Put it down, Bobo, Jim ordered. And close the door, added Joe. Now, what have we got here? He was a young man, apparently dead, though no wound appeared on him. Bobo patted a thigh. Eat him? He said hopefully. Saliva spilled out of his still-opened lips. Maybe, temporized Jim. Did you kill him? Bobo shook his undersized head. Good Bobo, Joe approved. Where did you hit him? Bobo hit him there. The microcephalic shoved a broad thumb against the supine figure in the area between the umbilicus and the breastbone. Good shot, Joe approved. We couldn't have done better with a knife. Bobo, good shot, the dwarf agreed blandly. Want see? He twitched his slingshot invitingly. Shut up, answered Joe, not unkindly. No, we don't want to see. We want to make him talk. Bobo fix, the short one agreed, and started with simple brutality to carry out his purpose. Joe Jim slapped him away and applied other methods, painful but considerably less drastic than those of the dwarf. The young man jerked and opened his eyes. Eat him? repeated Bobo. No, said Joe. When did you eat last? inquired Jim. Bobo shook his head and rubbed his stomach, indicating with graphic pantomime that it had been a long time, too long. Joe Jim went over to a locker, opened it, and withdrew a haunch of meat. He held it up. Jim smelled it, and Joe drew his head away in nose-wrinkling disgust. Joe Jim threw it to Bobo, who snatched it happily out of the air. Now get out, ordered Jim. Bobo trotted away, closing the door behind him. Joe Jim turned to the captive and prodded him with his foot. Speak up, said Jim. Who the huff are you? The young man shivered put a hand to his head, then seemed suddenly to bring his surroundings into focus, for he scrambled to his feet, moving awkwardly against the low weight conditions of this level, and reached for his knife. It was not at his belt. Joe Jim had his own out and brandished it. Be good and you won't get hurt. What do they call you? The young man wet his lips and his eyes hurried about the room. Speak up, said Joe. Why bother with him? inquired Jim. I'd say he was only good for meat. Better call Bobo back. No hurry about that, Joe answered. I want to talk to him. What's your name? The prisoner looked again at the knife and muttered, Hugh Hoyland? That doesn't tell us much, Jim commented. What do you do? What village do you come from? And what were you doing in Muty country? but this time Hoyland was sullen. Even the prick of the knife against his ribs caused him only to bite his lips. Shucks, said Joe. He's only a stupid peasant. Let's drop it. Shall we finish him off? No, not now. Shut him up. Joe Jim opened the door of a small side compartment and urged Hugh in with the knife. He then closed and fastened the door and went back to his game. Your move, Jim. The compartment in which Hugh was locked was dark. 
He soon satisfied himself by touch that the smooth steel walls were entirely featureless save for the solid, securely fastened door. Presently, he lay down on the deck and gave himself up to fruitless thinking. He had plenty of time to think, time to fall asleep and awaken more than once, and time to grow very hungry and very, very thirsty. When Joe Jim next took sufficient interest in his prisoner to open the door of the cell, Hoyland was not immediately in evidence. He had planned many times what he would do when the door opened and his chance came, but when the event arrived, he was too weak, semi-comatose. Joe Jim dragged him out. The disturbance roused him to partial comprehension. He sat up and stared around him. Ready to talk? asked Jim. Hoyland opened his mouth, but no words came out. Can't you see he's too dry to talk? Joe told his twin. Then to Hugh, Will you talk if we give you some water? Hoyland looked puzzled, then nodded vigorously. Joe Jim returned in a moment with a mug of water. Hugh drank greedily, paused, and seemed about to faint. Joe Jim took the mug from him. That's enough for now, said Joe. Tell us about yourself. Hugh did so, in detail, being prompted from time to time. Hugh accepted a de facto condition of slavery with no particular resistance and no great disturbance of soul. The word slave was not in his vocabulary, but the condition was a commonplace in everything he had ever known. There had always been those who gave orders and those who carried them out. He could imagine no other condition, no other type of social organization. It was a fact of nature, though naturally he thought of escape. Thinking about it was as far as he got. Joe Jim guessed his thoughts and brought the matter out into the open. Joe told him, Don't go getting ideas, youngster. Without a knife, you wouldn't get three levels away in this part of the ship. If you managed to steal a knife from me, you still wouldn't make it down to high weight. Besides, there's Bobo. Hugh waited a moment, as was fitting, then said, Bobo? Jim grinned and replied, We told Bobo that you were his to butcher, if he liked, if you ever stuck your head out of our compartments without us. Now he sleeps outside the door and spends a lot of his time there. It was only fair, put in Joe. He was disappointed when we decided to keep you. Say, suggested Jim, turning his head toward his brothers. How about some fun? He turned back to Hugh. Can you throw a knife? Of course, Hugh answered. Let's see you. Here. Joe Jim handed him their own knife. Hugh accepted it, jiggling it in his hand to try its balance. Try my mark. Joe Jim had a plastic target set up at the far end of the room from his favorite chair, on which he was wont to practice his own skill. Hugh eyed it, and, with an arm motion too fast to follow, let fly. He used the economical underhand stroke, thumb on the blade, fingers together. The blade shivered in the target, well centered in the chewed up area which marked Joe Jim's best efforts. Good boy, Joe approved. What do you have in mind, Jim? Let's give him the knife and see how far he gets. No, said Joe. I don't agree. Why not? If Bobo wins, we're out one servant. If Hugh wins, we lose both Bobo and him. It's wasteful. Oh, well, if you insist, I do. Hugh, fetch the knife. Hugh did so. It had not occurred to him to turn the knife against Joe Jim. The master was the master. For servant to attack master was not simply repugnant to good morals. It was an idea so wild that it did not occur to him at all. Hugh had expected that Joe Jim would be impressed by his learning as a scientist. It did not work out that way. Joe Jim, especially Jim, loved to argue. They sucked Hugh dry in short order and figuratively cast him aside. Hoyland felt humiliated. After all, was he not a scientist? Could he not read and write? Shut up, Jim told him. Reading is simple. 
I could do it before your father was born. Do you think you're the first scientist that has served me? Scientists, bah, a pack of ignoramuses. In an attempt to re-establish his own intellectual conceit, Hugh expounded the theories of the younger scientists, the strictly matter-of-fact, hard-boiled realism which rejected all religious interpretation and took the ship as it was. He confidently expected Joe Jim to approve such a point of view. It seemed to fit their temperaments. They laughed in his face. Honest, Jim insisted when he had ceased snorting. Are you young punks so stupid as all that? Why, you're worse than your elders. But you just got through saying, Hugh protested in hurt tones, that all our accepted religious notions are so much bunk. That is just what my friends think. They want to junk all that old nonsense. Joe started to speak. Jim cut in ahead of him. Why bother with him, Joe? He's hopeless. No, he's not. I'm enjoying this. He's the first one I've talked with, and I don't know how long who stood any chance at all of seeing the truth. Let us be. I want to see whether that's a head he has on his shoulders, or just a place to hang his ears. Okay, Jim agreed. But keep it quiet. I'm going to take a nap. The left-hand head closed its eyes. Soon it was snoring. Joe and Hugh continued their discussion in whispers. The trouble with you youngsters, Joe said, is that if you can't understand a thing right off, you think it can't be true. The trouble with your elders is, anything they didn't understand, they reinterpreted to mean something else and then thought they understood it. None of you has tried believing clear words the way they were written and then tried to understand them on that basis. Oh, no, you're all too bloody smart for that. If you can't see it right off, it ain't so. It must mean something different. What do you mean? Hugh asked suspiciously. Well, take the trip, for instance. What does it mean to you? Well, to my mind, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a piece of nonsense to impress the peasants. And what is the accepted meaning? Well, it's where you go when you die, or rather what you do. You make the trip to Centaurus. And what is Centaurus? It's, mind you, I'm just telling you the orthodox answers. I don't really believe this stuff. It's where you arrive when you've made the trip, a place where everybody's happy and there's always good eating. Joe snorted. Jim broke the rhythm of his snoring, opened one eye and settled back again with a grunt. That's just what I mean, Joe went on in a lower whisper. You don't use your head. Did it ever occur to you that the trip was just what the old books said it was? The ship and all the crew actually going somewhere? Moving? Hoyland thought about it. You don't mean for me to take you seriously. Physically, it's an impossibility. The ship can't go anywhere. It already is everywhere. We can make a trip through it, but the trip, that has to have a spiritual meaning, if it has any. Joe called on Jordan to support him. Now listen, he said. Get this through that thick head of yours. Imagine a place a lot bigger than the ship. A lot bigger, with the ship inside it, moving. Do you get it? Hugh tried. He tried very hard. He shook his head. It doesn't make sense, he said. There can't be anything bigger than the ship. There wouldn't be any place for it to be. Oh, for Huff's sake. Listen, outside the ship, get that? Straight down beyond the level in every direction. Emptiness out there. Understand me? But there isn't anything below the lowest level. That's why it's the lowest level. Look, if you took a knife and started digging a hole in the floor of the lowest level, where would it get you? But you can't. It's too hard. But suppose you did, and it made a hole. Where would that hole go? Imagine it. Hugh shut his eyes and tried to imagine digging a hole in the lowest level. Digging as if it were soft, soft as cheese. 
he began to get some glimmering of a possibility, a possibility that was unsettling, soul-shaking. He was falling, falling into a hole that he had dug which had no levels under it. He opened his eyes very quickly. That's awful, he ejaculated. I won't believe it. Joe Jim got up. I'll make you believe it, he said grimly, if I have to break your neck to do it. He strode over to the outer door and opened it. Bobo, he shouted. Bobo! Jim's head snapped erect. What's the matter? What's going on? We're going to take Hugh to no weight. What for? To pound some sense into his silly head. Some other time. No, I want to do it now. All right, all right. No need to shake. I'm awake now, anyhow. Joe Jim Gregory was almost as nearly unique in his, or their, mental ability as he was in his bodily construction. Under any circumstances, he would have been a dominant personality. Among the muties, it was inevitable that he should bully them, order them about, and live on their services. Had he had the will to power, it is conceivable that he could have organized the muties to fight and overcome the crew proper but he lacked that drive. He was by native temperament an intellectual, a bystander, an observer. He was interested in the how and the why, but his will to action was satisfied with comfort and convenience alone. Had he been born two normal twins and among the crew, it is likely that he would have drifted into scientisthood as the easiest and most satisfactory answer to the problem of living and as such would have entertained himself mildly with conversation and administration. As it was, he lacked mental companionship, and had whiled away three generations reading and re-reading books stolen for him by his stooges. The two halves of his dual person had argued and discussed what they had read, and had almost inevitably arrived at a reasonably coherent theory of history and the physical world, except in one respect— the concept of fiction was entirely foreign to them. They treated the novels that had been provided for the Jordan expedition in exactly the same fashion that they did the text and reference books. This led to their one major difference of opinion. Jim regarded Alan Quartermain as the greatest man who had ever lived. Joe held out for John Henry. They were both inordinately fond of poetry— they could recite page after page of Kipling, and were nearly as fond of Riesling, the blind singer of the spaceways. Bobo backed in. Joe Jim hooked a thumb toward Hugh. Look, said Joe, he's going out. No, said Bobo happily, and grinned, slavering. You and your stomach, Joe answered, wrapping Bobo's pate with his knuckles. No, you don't eat him. You and him, blood brothers, get it? Not eat him? No, fight for him. He fights for you. Okay. The pinhead shrugged his shoulders at the inevitable. Blood brothers. Bobo, no. All right. Now, we go up to the place where everybody flies. You go ahead and make lookout. They climbed in single file the dwarf running ahead to spot the lie of the land. Hoyland behind him, Joe Jim bringing up the rear, Joe with eyes to the front, Jim watching their rear, head turned over his shoulder. Higher and higher they went, weight slipping imperceptibly from them with each successive deck. They emerged finally into a level beyond which there was no further progress, no opening above them. The deck curved gently, suggesting that the true shape of the space was a giant cylinder. But overhead, a metallic expanse, which exhibited a similar curvature, obstructed the view and prevented one from seeing whether or not the deck in truth curved back on itself. There were no proper bulkheads. Great stanchions, so huge and squat as to give an impression of excessive, unnecessary strength, grew thickly about them, spacing deck and overhead, evenly apart. Weight was imperceptible. If one remained quietly in one place, 
the undetectable residuum of weight would bring the body in a gentle drift down to the floor, but up and down were terms largely lacking in meaning. Hugh did not like it. It made him gulp, but Bobo seemed delighted by it and not unused to it. He moved through the air like an uncouth fish, banking off stanchion, floor plate, and overhead as suited his convenience. Joe Jim set a course parallel to the common axis of the inner and outer cylinders, following a passageway formed by the orderly spacing of the stanchions. There were handrails set along the passage, one of which he followed like a spider on its thread. He made remarkable speed, which Hugh floundered to maintain. In time, he caught the trick of the easy, effortless overhead pull, the long coast against nothing but air resistance, and the occasional flick of the toes or the hand against the floor. But he was much too busy to tell how far they went before they stopped. Miles, he guessed it to be, but he did not know. When they did stop, it was because the passage had terminated. A solid bulkhead, stretching away to right and left, barred their way. Joe Jim moved along it to the right, searching. He found what he sought— a man-sized door, closed, its presence distinguishable only by a faint crack which marked its outline and a cursive geometrical design on its surface. Joe Jim studied this and scratched his right-hand head. The two heads whispered to each other. Joe Jim raised his hand in an awkward gesture. No, no, said Jim. Joe Jim checked himself. How's that? Joe answered. They whispered together again. Joe nodded, and Joe Jim again raised his hand. He traced the design on the door without touching it, moving his forefinger through the air, perhaps four inches from the surface of the door. The order of succession in which his finger moved over the lines of the design appeared simple, but certainly not obvious. Finished, he shoved a palm against the adjacent bulkhead, drifted back from the door, and waited. A moment later, there was a soft, almost inaudible, insufflation. The door stirred and moved outward perhaps six inches, then stopped. Joe Jim appeared puzzled. He ran his hands cautiously into the open crack and pulled. Nothing happened. He called to Bobo. Open it! Bobo looked the situation over, with a scowl on his forehead, which wrinkled almost to his crown. He then placed his feet against the bulkhead, steadying himself by grasping the door with one hand. He took hold of the edge of the door with both hands, settled his feet firmly, bowed his body, and strained. He held his breath, chest rigid, back bent, sweat breaking out from the effort. The great cords in his neck stood out, making up his head a misshapen pyramid, Hugh could hear the dwarf's joints crack. It was easy to believe that he would kill himself with the attempt, too stupid to give up. But the door gave suddenly, with a plaint of binding metal. As the door, in swinging out, slipped from Bobo's fingers, the unexpectedly released tension in his legs shoved him heavily away from the bulkhead. He plunged down the passageway, floundering for a handhold. But he was back in a moment drifting awkwardly through the air as he massaged a cramped calf. Joe Jim led the way inside, Hugh close behind him. What is this place? demanded Hugh, his curiosity overcoming his servant manners. The main control room, said Joe. Main control room, the most sacred and taboo place in the ship, its very location a forgotten mystery. In the credo of the young men, it was non-existent. The older scientists varied in their attitude between fundamentalist acceptance and mystical belief. As enlightened as Hugh believed himself to be, the very words frightened him. The control room. Why, the very spirit of Jordan was said to reside there. He stopped. Joe Jim stopped, and Joe looked around. Come on, he said. What's the matter? Why, uh, uh... Speak up. But, 
But this place is haunted. This is Jordan's... Oh, for Jordan's sake, protested Joe, with slow exasperation. I thought you told me you young punks didn't take any stock in Jordan. Yes, but... but this is... Stow it. Come along or I'll have Bobo drag you. He turned away. Hugh followed, reluctantly, as a man climbs a scaffold. They threaded through a passageway just wide enough for two to use the handrails abreast. The passage curved in a wide, sweeping arc of full ninety degrees, then opened into the control room proper. Hugh peered past Joe Jim's broad shoulders, fearful but curious. He stared into a well-lighted room, huge, quite two hundred feet across. It was spherical, the interior of a great globe. The surface of the globe was featureless, frosted silver. In the geometrical center of the sphere, Hugh saw a group of apparatus about fifteen feet across. To his inexperienced eye, it was completely unintelligible. He could not have described it, but he saw that it floated steadily, with no apparent support. Running from the end of the passage to the mass at the center of the globe was a tube of metal latticework, wide as the passage itself. It offered the only exit from the passage. Joe Jim turned to Bobo and ordered him to remain in the passageway, then entered the tube. He pulled himself along it, hand over hand, the bars of the latticework making a ladder. Hugh followed him. They emerged into the mass of apparatus occupying the center of the sphere. Seen close up, the gear of the control station resolved itself into its individual details, but it still made no sense to him. He glanced away from it to the inner surface of the globe which surrounded them. That was a mistake. The surface of the globe, being featureless silvery white, had nothing to lend it perspective. It might have been a hundred feet away, or a thousand, or many miles. He had never experienced an unbroken height greater than that between two decks, nor an open space larger than the village common. He was panic-stricken, scared out of his wits, the more so in that he did not know what it was he feared. But the ghost of long-forgotten jungle ancestors possessed him and chilled his stomach with the basic, primitive fear of falling. He clutched at the control gear, clutched at Joe Jim. Joe Jim let him have one, hard across the mouth with the flat of his hand. What's the matter with you? growled Jim. I don't know, Hugh presently managed to get out. I don't know, but I don't like this place. Let's get out of here. Jim lifted his eyebrows to Joe, looked disgusted, and said, We might as well. That weak-bellied baby will never understand anything you tell him. Oh, he'll be all right, Joe replied, dismissing the matter. Hugh, climb into one of the chairs. There, that one. In the meantime, Hugh's eyes had fallen on the tube whereby they had reached the control center and had followed it back by eye to the passage door. The sphere suddenly shrank to its proper focus, and the worst of his panic was over. He complied with the order, still trembling, but able to obey. The control center consisted of a rigid framework, made up of chairs, or frames, to receive the bodies of the operators, and consolidated instrument and report panels, mounted in such a fashion as to be almost in the laps of the operators, where they were readily visible but did not obstruct the view. The chairs had high supporting sides, or arms, and mounted in these arms were the controls appropriate to each officer on watch, but Hugh was not yet aware of that. He slid under the instrument panel into his seat and settled back, glad of its enfolding stability. It fitted him in a semi-reclining position, footrest to head support. But something was happening on the panel in front of Joe Jim. He caught it out of the corner of his eye and turned to look. Bright red letters glowed near the top of the board. Second Astrogator posted. What was a second Astrogator? He didn't know. Then he noticed that the extreme top of his own board was labeled Second Astrogator, and concluded it must be himself, or rather, the man who should be sitting there. He felt momentarily uncomfortable 
that the proper second astrogator might come in and find him usurping his post, but he put it out of his mind. It seemed unlikely. But what was a second astrogator, anyhow? The letters faded from Joe Jim's board. A red dot appeared on the left-hand edge and remained. Joe Jim did something with his right hand. His board reported, Acceleration, zero. Then, Main Drive. The last two words blinked several times, then were replaced with, No Report. These words faded out, and a bright green dot appeared near the right-hand edge. Get ready, said Joe, looking toward Hugh. The light is going out. You're not going to turn out the light, protested Hugh. No, you are. Take a look by your left hand. See those little white lights? Hugh did so, and found, shining up through the surface of the chair arm, eight bright little beads of light arranged in two squares, one above the other. Each one controls the light of one quadrant, explained Joe. Cover them with your hand to turn out the light. Go ahead. Do it. Reluctantly, but fascinated, Hugh did as he was directed. He placed a palm over the tiny lights and waited. The silvery sphere turned to dull lead, faded still more, leaving them in darkness complete save for the slight glow from the instrument's panels. Hugh felt nervous but exhilarated. He withdrew his palm. The sphere remained dark. The eight little lights had turned blue. Now, said Joe, I'm going to show you the stars. In the darkness, Joe Jim's right hand slid over another pattern of eight lights.